Hello. <laughs> I am a philosopher of science, and of course, the cosmologist you just heard from, Joel Premack, is my husband, and I have been living with him the entire 40 years that he has been developing this theory. We just had our 40th anniversary. <laughs> well, well, we have talked about it a lot, and the question is, what does it mean for us that we are not living in the universe we all thought we were in? Everybody's assumptions about ultimate reality, no matter what they were, are wrong. So for years, Joel and I, whenever we would meet a religious leader or teacher, we would ask them, what difference does it make to your religion that the universe is expanding? And sadly, I must say that we got more or less the same answer from everyone. The answer was, the science is fascinating, but the details don't really matter of how the universe operates, because however it works, God did it. <laughs> well, you know, the fact is, you can't know what's possible or impossible until you know what kind of a universe you're living in. We are living in one where a great drama is taking place between dark matter and dark energy. Dark matter's gravity is pulling the atomic matter together, while dark energy is flinging space apart. And the multi-billion year interaction between these dark giants has spun the galaxies into being and created the only possible homes for the evolution of planets and life. So Joel, as he men mentioned that we have written two books together, well, we probably gave about 100 talks about those two books. And, you know, it's about the universe. But sooner or later, at almost every one of those talks, someone asked, but do you believe in God? Now, <laughs> I'll be very honest that this is not just a philosophical question to me because I've been in a 12-step program for 30 years. So it's actually been a life or death quest for me to find an answer to that question that makes sense to me, that is coherent with everything I know, but also energizes me to do what I could not do alone. Now, I'm not interested in the kind of God you have to believe in, I'm only interested in God if it's real. If it's real, I want it. Now, I don't mean real like this podium, or like a feeling, or even like a test score. I mean real in the double dark universe. And what got me thinking in a new way was something I saw on TV. It was an interview that was filmed in the 1950s with the great psychoanalyst Carl Jung. At the end of this long interview, the interviewer asked Jung, does God exist? <laughs> and Jung said, what I know for certain is that every person has a God capacity. And I was really struck by this word, God capacity, because I knew that Jung had written that all people crave ideas and convictions that can give meaning to their lives and to help them find, and this is his phrase, their place in the universe. So I think that by God capacity, he meant that we have the capacity to satisfy this need for a meaningful place in the universe with some version of God or God's. So a capacity is something that belongs to us as individual humans, not as members of any religion or ideology. It's not tied to any symbol. It's not tied to any specific tradition. It doesn't require any particular view of God. It is our ability to scratch that itch for meaning with a symbol. I think it's a tragedy that so many people in these high-tech, globally interconnected, volatile times are still looking for meaning from a God that made sense in a slavery society where the earth was flat. 
The whole purpose of our God capacity is to help us find the kind of God our best life demands and responds to. So Jung's comment really turned my thinking around and I realized I never used my God capacity. I didn't even realize I had one. So how would a science-oriented person use a God capacity? Well, I'm looking for a God that's real. So a God that's real can only be real in the real universe. There's no place outside our universe that will ever be in contact with us. So if there is something godlike out there, it's not our God. So I asked myself, I asked myself a different question. And the question was this, could anything actually exist in the scientific universe that is so godlike to us that it is worthy of the title God? Isn't the real question, what is worthy of that title? So here's my discovery. It turns out there is something absolutely real in our universe that is godlike to us, completely consistent with science, in fact, inspired by it. It is in constant nourishing contact with every one of us from about the age of 18 months until the day we die. No one can ever fully understand this godlike thing, although we have discovered its origin. But because it's real, it's possible that through research, we may be able in the future to glean a few sparks of its nature. So what is this real but mysterious thing I'm talking about? Well, it's based on the scientific concept of emergence, the very subject of this conference. So let me give you a very quick example of emergence. I like to use ants. Ants are on every continent on this planet, except, ironically, Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> They're very simple. They follow pheromone trails. They can tell the difference between meeting two ants in a moment in, and then meeting 200 ants, they can tell that. But that is the extent of their communication abilities. However, if we observe 10,000 of them together in a colony, a very sophisticated swarm logic emerges. So the colony can continually adjust the number of ants that are sent out foraging for food, based on several factors, the number of mouths to feed, how much food is already stored in the nest, how much food is available in the vicinity, even whether there are other ant colonies out there competing. And yet, not one single ant understands any of this. It can build, the, the ants can build a, a, an anthill taller than a man. There's not a single ant engineer or architect. So what is going on? Where does the sophistication of swarm logic come from? It's something that emerges not from the nature of the ants, but from the complexity of their interactions. And this is the law throughout the universe. From the growing complexity of simpler parts interacting, radically new phenomena emerge on larger size scales. So from trillions of microscopic cells interacting, a person, you, have emerged. You, the person, you, are an emergent phenomenon. So you can see that emergent phenomena are as real as the parts that make them up. So on still larger scales, when we all interact collectively, whether intentionally or not, this also spawns emergent phenomena. So for example, from people's never-ending efforts to get each other to behave civilly, governments and legal systems have emerged. From our craving for gossip and information, the media and all the fields of scholarship have emerged. From people trading goods, 
the most complicated emergent phenomenon we can imagine, the global economy has emerged. So all these emergent phenomena are abstract, but they are absolutely real because they exercise enormous power over our lives. They follow complicated rules we will never fully understand, but they're not human, and they're not human-like, even though they're made from human activities. So it seems to me that a real God, something God-like to us, can only have emerged from us. But from what aspect of us? It has to be something that everybody does and everybody has always done. And I believe the answer is, it comes from the fact that all of us aspire. We are the aspiring species. Different people aspire to different things, but everyone aspires to something every day of their lives, even if it's only to be left alone. Our aspirations are what make each of us into individuals. If we didn't have any aspirations, we would just be meat with habits. From people aspiring to communicate and live better, there emerged language and cooking and music. Through many generations of people aspiring to understand what lies beyond the visible world, some of our most profound ideas have come about, like meaning, universe, spirit, creation. Ideals like truth, justice, human rights, freedom, these have all taken many generations to clarify con collectively, and they're still not finished. So these are all ideas that no individual could ever have invented or imagined without a social context in which it was meaningful to do so. By the laws of emergence, something has to have emerged from the staggering complexity of all of humanity's aspirations interacting. This emergent phenomenon has created the meaning sphere in which we all live. Of course, it didn't create the 13.8 billion year old universe because it's younger than we are. It emerged from us, but it created the meaning of the universe, which is what matters to us. By definition, nothing meaningless can matter. So for me, this emergent phenomenon is the most godlike thing that actually exists. If anything real deserves the title of God, it's this. We feed this emergent phenomenon with our aspirations, and it feeds our consciousness with meaning and the sense of belonging to each other and to the future and the past. Basically, what I'm saying here is we need to let the universe teach us about God rather than always using scriptures to do the opposite. A god that emerges from humanity's aspirations is a spectacular planetary phenomenon happening here on Earth, on this jewel of a planet. If there are other intelligent, aspiring aliens on other worlds, it's possible that gods have emerged from them too, but we could be the first. We could be. So it doesn't matter if you're Hindu or Christian or Jewish or ath atheist or agnostic, I am not proposing an alternative religious idea. I'm explaining an emergent phenomenon that actually exists. You don't have to call it God. It's still real. So some of you might be wondering at this point, well, why not just give the godlike phenomenon a different name and don't use this name with all the baggage, this loaded word God? Why are you doing that? So let me just tell you why I'm doing that. God is arguably the most powerful idea that the human mind can conceive. If there were anything else more powerful, it would be God. 
everyone in the entire world over the age of two or three has some sort of notion or feeling when they hear the word God, whether it's positive, negative, confused, or indifferent. God is not a concept we can simply choose to erase. So neuroscientists, you probably know, have this saying, neurons that fire together, wire together. And after thousands, possibly tens of thousands of years of everyone using this concept of God or gods in every language, it's probably hardwired into our brains. So rather than pretend to erase it, what we need to ask is, how can we best use this fact about ourselves? A passionate feeling about God has led to wars, injustice, depravity, and insane behavior throughout history. And it still does when misdirected, as we can see in the newspaper every day. But it has also given us art, imagination, reverence, sacrifice, comfort, community, and above all, endurance. It's been for millions of people the only refuge in lives that are intolerable beyond the imagination of almost anybody in this room. So there is no question that the idea of God can be horribly abused, but that doesn't mean we don't need it. It means we have to tame it the way our ancestors tamed fire. It is our fire. No culture has ever lived long without it, and we are not likely to either. And I think that this fire is what many smart people today are missing because they have passively accepted some old view of God in order to reject it. This may be why we are failing miserably to confront climate change and the other global problems facing us. We don't share a big picture. We have nothing to unite us. And in this scientific age, we have no believable metaphor to be our bridge to carry our consciousness into the universe and into ourselves. We humans are going to need every advantage we can conceivably muster to get through the coming upheavals in our society and to come out on the other side with a just and sustainable world. Can we use our God capacity to help our species? Or should we just pretend it's unimportant and perhaps even obsolete and abandon this vast, enduring power evoked by the feeling of God, abandon it by default to the most rigid and backward-thinking people? on this planet. Well, that sounds to me like a recipe for endless conflict, science denial, and extinction. And there's an alternative. We have all grown up so steeped in tradition, whether we've accepted it or rebelled against it, that it's hard to believe, but the chance to redefine God is actually in our hands. The way we do it, or fail to do it, will play a central role in the future of our planet. I don't expect millions of people to change their ideas of God overnight, but I totally expect it to happen in the somewhat longer term. God ideas are going to continue to evolve as they have for thousands of years, and unless we face this fact consciously, we will never be able to bring our best knowledge into the process of thinking, what should God be for our time? To a world whose survival may depend, will depend, on cooperating on scales we have never accomplished before, it could make all the difference to have a scientific big picture that includes a God that is real, that is in touch with every person on earth, and that is in harmony with the universe. Thank you.
Thank you so much.